But I'm very pleased to now bring us to our final session of the day, which is a very um, important one given the scale of issues going on in the area. So in a moment, I'm going to ask Maggie Turnbull to um, <coughs> invite our speakers up for what we're calling case study two, which are the impacts of industrial scale agriculture and particularly industrial scale irrigation on the Darling River and Menindee Lakes. Uh, we have a number of speakers that are joining us in person today, and we're very grateful to everyone who's traveled to be here with us. If all goes well, we'll have a couple of speakers on technology as well. A couple of folks who may not be able to join us due to technical issues will um, submit oral testimony and written documents as part of the, the broader process. So I think what we're gonna to aim to do is, um, originally we had set aside two hours for this. We will still be able to proceed and finish by, I think, before five o'clock. So I'll hand over now to um, Maggie Turnbull. Maggie, thank you. I would now like to invite Fred Hooper to speak to us. Could you please tell us your name and where you are from? Um, my name is Fred Hooper. I'm the chairperson of the Northern Murray-Darling Basin, uh, Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations and I'm also the chair of the Murawari People's Council uh, of the Murawari Republic. Can you tell us about the impacts of colonisation and upstream development on your lands? When we get the um, slideshow working. <laughs> Just um, while we're doing that, we've had some great speakers today and um, you know, I was very, very impressed with the way that, that um, people are doing things and um, looking after Mother Earth and um, just make this observation. The Murray people, we declared our, our independence from Great Britain in uh, March 2012. We created our own constitution and in our own constitution, we have the rights of Mother Earth. And the constitution in the Murray Republic protects Mother Earth, Earth's right and it punishes us if we do anything against, against her. So I'm not here to talk about that though, I'm talking about um, the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, Firstly, in saying that, I'd like to acknowledge all of the sovereign First Nations um, of the continent of Australia, particularly the sovereign First Nations in the northern Murray-Darling Basin where I, I, I conduct business, and acknowledge there that they have never ceded their sovereignty and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and encourage elders of the future to lead with honour, dignity and respect for all. So I'm going to go through three stages. One is, um, we, we, we're talking about law this morning, we're talking about connection and all that type of stuff as well. So this is our landscape management process. Don't be greedy, don't take any more than you need and respect everything around you. This old fellow here is from a little place called Kunnamulla out west and he's gonna tell you a little story. When you're ready, brother. Sometimes we misuse your resources, how yeah, that Mundagata, it could dry the water out of it. It would make the riverbed dry, and he'd go down underground and follow the channels to another water system and, until you got punished enough. And then he might come back and send you some rain and he'd come back again. So that was uh, how we learned about protecting the water. You. You had to look after the water. As I said, Aboriginal people were doing that protection for thousands and thousands of years. And, and, uh, and even today, I'd never heard one mentioned about, they knew any things about the, the laws of the water, but uh, it was an unwritten law wherever the level of the normal water level of a water hole was. Uh, no one could claim any ground within, say, two, two couple of metres up from that. That was water, that was the land that not even the Aboriginal or anyone else, that was where water was allowed to flow free to people below you. Mm. Next slide. Yeah. That's good. Mm. Mm. Um, go back. Sorry. So that's, that's, a, that's the way we manage land as First Nations people and as First Nations. Now I'd like to show you how you manage land as 
So, um, yeah, just out of the way for um, non-First Nations people manage land. If we can get this one going, I've got somebody in New South Wales that's going to be able to tell you also. G'day everyone, Jeremy Buckingham here. I'm on Covey Station near Deer and Bandy in southern Queensland and this is the Colgoa River which should flow on to the Darling system but it's been stopped here by this weir which is siphoning water off into the Covey system to grow large crops of cotton. And just outside Deer and Bandy at their massive gin here we see thousands upon thousands of bales of cotton all grown with water that would have gone down the Darling system. Almost no water is making it down, so towns like Broken Hill, Menindi, and the Darling system is drying out and dying. It's a national tragedy. The Murray-Darling Basin plan is failing, and it's failing because we do not have the courage to stand up to Big Cotton and say, this is just not right. So, this is a burning river. Does any, can anybody tell me where this burning river is? Sorry. It's a Dolby in Queensland. At the Condamine? Yeah. The Condamine River is dying. It's, it's, it's on fire. Yep. Um, this is a stretch of the Murray-Darling from Warwick in Queensland and where it runs into the Darling River at Burke. You can see there only 24% of water crosses the, um, the border of New South Wales that runs into um, to, to New South Wales. And it's because of that big development that's upstream. We look at the development of Cubby Station and we say, oh, it's the biggest cotton farm in Australia. But the St George Irrigation Area is just as big. There are so many off-farm, oh, sorry, on-farm private storages of water. I hear Barnaby and all of those people saying we need to build dams. Well, they need to look at the dams that they've, they've, they've allowed the cotton industry to build to store water for private use as well. Um, and by only 24% of that water coming across the New South Wales border, New South Wales and Queensland border, it, fec it affects our culture and heritage affects our ability to go and fish, to go and collect bush tucker, but also it affects um, our, our nations in a way that at a place called Woolloomeringal, we have not caught a cod since 2000. The last cod that was caught was during the, two, the millennium drought and it was pulled out of a water hole that went dry. Um, and that was the last time we ever caught a cod in the, in the Colgoa River. Next one. So what are we doing um, about this? Right. As I said, I'm the chair of the Northern, Mar uh, Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations. We're, we're an organisation that represents 22 sovereign First Nations. Our purpose um, is but not limited to re representing these sovereign First Nations in the northern Murray-Darling Basin in a, cult uh, in a cultural and natural resource um, on, on those issues. And our aim is to keep our water spirits and connections alive. And in 2012, I was in Perth and I was at Curtin University and somebody that was with me was giving a speech. And after we finished, I walked outside and this, this old Aboriginal guy from over that way, he walked up to me and he said, Fred, and I don't know how he knew my name because I never introduced myself to anybody. I just sat there. He said, you know that Mundagata you talk about over there? He said, you've got to protect him over there now because they're destroying his home in the Pilbara. So that connection, and I was at a Senate or a House of Representatives inquiry and there was a guy called Warren Hinch or something, not Hinch, Hinch or something from up there in North Queensland. He questioned me on that and he asked me, what are the connections? And the Mundagata, or the Rainbow Serpent, everybody calls it, connects us. 
connects every single nation in this country or every single First Nation on this continent. So, go back. So, as a part of our job, we, we do a lot of work with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and we undertook a, a major research project over the last six years. And it was based on what they call the Echuca Declaration, which was a declaration that was done um, on the Murray River in Echuca back in 2007. And it looked at how we um, would look at water rights. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the major statements was that was a cultural flow. And there's a description of what a cultural flow is. And a part of that, what they did was they, done, they undertook two research sites. This research site is 85 kilometres below Cubby Station on a station called Woolamaringal. Um, if you, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a word up there saying um, Kalgara River. Just there, there is a water hole. That's where we caught the last cod. Right? But that water hole is connected to another water hole which is 85 kilometres away um, at a place called Lednapper. And there's a spring at Lednapper. We call it Guerrero Springs. And the spring was a source of water for us. And it's the home of our Mundagata. So basically what happens is the Mundagata, in times of flood or in times that the river would run a banker, would travel and traverse the streams um, and the rivers. And so that Mundagata relied on floods coming down this system. Um, we undertook a project at Guerrero Springs earlier this year where we worked with the national parks to, to clear it out. You know, we had a... Um, one of them big backo things, you know, them big things that scoop the, the mud and everything up? We had one of those there. They scooped it out. They still couldn't reach the bottom. They got as far as high as this building, they couldn't reach the bottom. And it started to fill up with water again, you know? And um, so, and that, the reason why it wasn't running was feral goats. I heard Uncle there talk about feral goats, you know. They, they, they're starting to protect these feral goats. They are a menace to our land. If you can kill every single feral, feral goat, you'd make a lot of us First Nations people very, very happy. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, if we can get rid of those, they're the ones that are clogging up our water systems. Cattle are putting um, all the silt and everything into our rivers and waterways. We've done what we call an Aboriginal Waterways Assessment Program up near Warwick, and you can just see the, the difference between, you know, where it starts at Warwick and then when it gets down into the, to the farmlands um, as well. So, yep. Oh, here it comes. So there's two graphs that came out of the, Na the National Cultural Flows Research Project that I use. One is they've done the research and, and they've done the calculations and I don't know how they do it, hydrologists do all this stuff. On the left is pre-development and how many times that Kuruman Swamp, we, what we call Kuruman Swamp, was inundated with natural flows. On the right is post-development. Next slide, please. So one of, the, one of the findings was that we said we need 7,000 megalitres of, th uh, of water to flow past the gauge at Woolamringal to provide Kuruman Swamp with water. When we looked at the hydrology of Kuruman Swamp, it only required 125 megalitres of water. That's all it required. But we needed 7,000 megalitres to run past the gauge to fulfil the ecosystems that are connected to, to Kuruman Swamp as well. And they said to us, oh, let's just put a pump in, eh, and we'll, we'll fill the, pump, uh, the, the swamp up. And we just flatly said no, because we relied on a natural system 
to provide for us. One thing that I didn't say about the swamp as well, the river red guns that are contained within that swamp has the highest value to us. Mm -hmm. And in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, they talk about values and uses, Indigenous values and uses, objectives and outcomes. Those re river red guns are the highest value because they are our spiritual tree. Mm -hmm. It's where our old people would sit underneath those trees and talk to our ancestors in the, in, in, in the sky camp. And I'll just share a very brief little story. When a baby is, bo um, is in its mother's, mother's womb, it doesn't have a spirit in, our, in Murawari culture. So what happens, and I, and I sort of forgot to um, explain what the flag was up on the top there, um, but I'll, that's another thing. Um, and before a baby is born, just before a baby is born, the old people would be talking to the, to the ancestors and the spirit would come back on the falling star so it would ride back to earth on the falling star and it would jump off and then it would it, it'd hide behind a tree. Yeah. And when the baby's born, that spirit then jumps straight into that baby's body and gives it its first breath and its life and its soul. That's why those trees are very important to us because if we can't connect to our ancestors, we can't tell them all of the important things that has to happen um, you know, with the connection between us and the sky camp. So those river red gums that they talk about have the most mm -hmm. highest value. You can never, ever get anything higher in Murawari culture than that tree and we're what we call the Bala tree as well on the red country. Next slide. Oh, sorry, this slide, what this slide here is, is showing. So the mean frequency of events. So pre-development, as I said, that swamp would get filled. 86 times out of 100 years. Currently, with development upstream, it's 29 times in 100 years. With the full introduction of the basin plan um, on time, we could probably get it back to 48 times a year uh, in 100 years. So that equates, really, on average, pre-development, that swamp would be full um, or would get inundated on average once every three years. That's blowing out now to once in every 15 years and blowing out even further. And um, that's because of development upstream, not for food sources. Mm. I must say this. Yeah. It is not for food sources. It's for cotton. Um, and cotton is a, a big, um, big issue with, with all of our nations. Next one, brother. The Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations um, and the 22 Sovereign First Nations signed a treaty, treaty of unity at the embassy in Canberra on the 10th of May last year. The Treaty of Unity is amongst the 22 Sovereign First Nations of the Northern Basin. And the treaty combines us. It obligates us as First Nations people, it obligates us, us to, to look after our, you know, each of the nations and allow for that water to flow to the nation below us. Next one, brother. Um, as a part of the Cultural Flows Research Project, what came out of that was a, a cultural, flow cultural flows guide to First Nations. So it's a guide that's um, built on three stages and 10 steps. What the, the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations have done is we've modified the guide a little bit. And what we've did was um, we're looking at First Nations plans for those First Nations. We're not looking at a little water plan here or a little economic plan over there or something over there. We're looking at a plan for the whole of the nation. Um, and we're using this guide to do it. This, the, when, when the plans are developed, then we are going to then look at um, how we can use these plans to influence international, other international framework, like the, um, um, the system of environmental accounting, which is the United Nations framework. Next slide. So we're doing it through these nation, guiding, uh, nation 
uh, planning guides. I just come from a gathering of those 22 nations in Gundawindi this week. And we went through the nation planning guide. Next one. And then we did a, na a nation planning assessment using this tool of the Botanic Gardens in Gundawindi. So they went around, they looked at all the stuff that they planted there and all that, and um, so we, we, we assessed it. And all of the assessment tool, all the, the, the information that's in the assessment tool will actually then be, be put into a, um, a nation plan and we'll develop a nation plan. Each nation, each of the 22 sovereign first nations in the northern Murray-Darling Basin will go through this process to establish their nation plan or their country plan. Next one, please. And I don't know whether everybody heard about it, but there was an um, announcement by the minister a while ago, and he said, I'm going to give you, you, you Murray fellas, $20 million or $40 million to buy water and a whole heap of other things. This is our proposed model to manage that $20 million of water in the northern Murray-Darling Basin. Next one. Uh, I want to finish with this, and then uh, I just got a quick another video if we can get it up. Um, Nigel Scullion, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, when he was um, addressing the Gama Festival, he said this, it's a time for engagement, for discussion and for truth-telling, for recommitting to good ideas or putting aside bad ones. Scullion said he'd represented the Federal Cabinet at a meeting of the Yulanu leadership in the Dialect Council on Thursday and the two governments <clears throat> and discussed how to work together. If we can do it at a level of nation to nation, then it's possible for every Aboriginal nation across the country to be able to have a crack. If the farmers can work with us, if Uncle there was talking about the kangaroos, where well, he's still here or he's gone, if he's talking about the kangaroos, what about all them other animals? What about the emu? We call them gulbri, you know? What about the other animals out there that can be sustainably farmed? You know? Um, so I'll end with one more if we can get it going, brother, and that'll conclude my presentation. <coughs> and this is about the Darling River. No, it's not there. It's gone. Some powerful gremlins today. They're dark <coughs> gremlins. <coughs> That's all right. But it's, it, it is a, a poem called The Dying Darling. And I urge you to, to look it up on Facebook or wherever you go and look it up on. Um, look it up. And it's, a guy, it's, it's by a, an old gentleman called William Riley, who was an old Mullingumpa man. And um, he, he sadly passed on now. And, and he talks about his river. And I think it was a good segue into what we're talking about here because he come from Wilkenya on the Darling River. And, you know, there's been various studies about Wilkenya. And Wilkenya, when the river's not running, there's huge health problems. There are huge crime problems. When that river is running, they have none of those problems because the kids are out are down there and they're, they're playing in the river and they're, 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 they're being taught by their, their elders about their country. Um, and in a submission to the Murray-Darling Basin Authority in regards to the Northern Basin Review, the kids, we've we done, we done, a, done a, a session at Wilcania and the kids that were, were discarded from the, the school system, they weren't welcome in the school system in Wilcania they were under this other program. They came in and they sat when we were doing the discussions and they wrote the foreword to their submission to the Murray-Darling Basin. And one of the other things that, that, that we did and what we were responsible for, there was a whole heap of changes to the Murray-Darling Basin that was to go through the Senate uh, back in February, I think it was. Um, we were, along with the Lifeblood Alliance, we were very, very, um, um, how would I say this? We were very, very influ uh, we were very, very, well, we got the politicians to disallow the, motion, uh, disallow the, the amendments to the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. 
which resulted in um, the deal sheet between Tony Burke and, and uh, Little Proud in regards to um, um, ways of, of helping us in the Northern Murray Darling Basin achieve a whole heap of things. So, um, in saying that, if you look that, that poem up, it's called The Dying Darling, and it's by a, a guy called um, old Uncle William Riley. And um, he tells us how to fix the system. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Mm, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Fred. Does the panel have any questions? No. No. What? I have so many, <laughs> but I'm only restricted to at least one or two. But um, that's really exciting. I, I guess as a statement, it's really exciting what you're doing and what the groups are doing. Um, the cultural flow, I think, is, is really critical. And that's, um, and having a treaty between 22 um, sovereign nations in itself. And I noticed the, the actual, um, the guide said uh, yellow belly nation. Yep. Um, can you tell me where that comes from? Uh, it, it, what we did um, over the last couple of days was we were trialling this tool. Yep. And so we had four nations, five nations, sorry. We had the yellow belly, the eel, the um, gigi. Forgive me, I can't remember the other two. But um, So we split the groups up and we actually had government departments come along. So we had one of the heads of Department of uh, Agriculture, Department of Environment, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority um, and a whole heap of the Queensland government. They had representatives there. We broke them up into five different groups and they were nations. So we, we, we had the Yellow Belly Nation and, and, and all the other nations. And the nations... They had to go through a process that was uh, set out in the in the guide. So, firstly, they had to form a working group within their nation. Then they had to identify all the key stakeholders. They had to then identify either one or two people who were their key contacts. And then they did the assessment. So, um, yeah, the Yellow Belly, that was one of the nations, um, uh, hypothetical nations that were used last um, in the last few days. So... Um, we're hoping to roll that out now. Um, just under that deal sheet, we did get $1.2 million from the federal government to roll out the National Cultural Flows uh, Guide for Nations. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at rolling that out. And it, it covers a lot of the nations in, in southwest Queensland as well, so Goongri, Bidjara, um, a lot of those western, western uh, nations, and even the Githable up, and t up, up around Warwick and Waka Waka and all those nations around Toowoomba and that as well. So it's a way that we're using a tool and all of those things, as I said, will, will, will sort of um, lead up or they'll, they'll feed up into a northern basin plan and they, then hopefully one of the things that we said in, in the northern basin um, and when we talked about the, the treaty and, and, and the union of nations, we said we've got to treat ourselves as a nation. Mm. We can't be a part of the Australian nation because we have to think like that. If we go back to where we were, we were sovereign nations. We had law. You know, my law, when you're born, you get your land from your father. You get your totem from your mother. That's law. We had a marriage system. If you broke that marriage system, you had, you had to pay the consequences under law. You know, and that was... I don't know if you've seen it, there was a movie called Jetta. But in saying that, we are looking also at linking it to the 17 sustainable goals of the United Nations through what we call the SEA project. Um, we, we are looking at engaging a, a world um, expert on the ecosystem accounting. Um, he's worked with Fiji, he's worked with Uganda. He did a, um, a project in Uganda... Um, around mangroves to bring people out of poverty, working with um, um, Kazakhstan, I think it is now, to, um, um, to bring some of that stuff out of poverty as well. So what we've thought is we're sick to death of government because government, you know, they'll come in, they'll give you a little bit of money. When you, get, when you start to get successful, they pull that money away. And that sick was a cl classic example of that. Yeah. So we've, we're taking a different step. We're taking a step of, of 
building everything that we do from the ground up. Mm. And yeah. First Nations do that. And then we, <coughs> at the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nation, we then relay it. The other thing that we've, we, we're looking at doing is doing an economic development strategy um, that will assist the First Nations economically. So I noticed they had Qantas and everything up there, you know. Um, so, you know, carbon crediting. The other thing we, we, could, we could be looking at is, is green river corridors as well. So they're just some of the things that we're looking at. Um, but one of the things that we do, and it's our absolute no-no, we don't get involved in nation business. That's that nation's business. And that nation can't tell another nation what to do, you know, as well. And when, when they come to our meetings, when they meet as a sovereign uh, union or sovereign First Nations, they're coming as representatives of their nations. Um, and we're hoping that it can open a whole, lot, a whole heap of stuff out, up to international, um, you know, funding such as the World Bank, the China Development Bank, um, you know, First Nations. One of my dreams um, would be, wouldn't it be great if we can have First Nation to First Nation trade? Absolutely. Why can't we I... trade our kangaroo over there to, to all the other countries, to First Nations, and they be our agent for kangaroo? Yeah. And I've noticed something, in, and I'll, I'll finish with this, I've noticed something with all the presentations. The people that are doing things with our native foods and our native animals are not First Nations people. There are some First Nations people that are doing it, but the majority are not First Nations people. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> oh, Fred, Fred, I had a quick question, Dal. <laughs> I was putting my hand up. <laughs> hey, I, no, no, I wasn't pointing that way. I was going, eh. um, thank you so much. It's, it's really excellent to hear from you. Oh, oh okay. Um, I was just wondering, Fred, um, because we're interested in looking at what, you know, um, post-colonisation impacts have been on food and fibre, and we hear a lot about the cotton. In terms of kind of particularly for the health of the Darling River, can you tell me, would you think, what, can you tell me what you think is like one of the, a couple of the main things that need to happen to get water back into the Darling, particularly when it relates to cotton? Get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, um, it's a high, high use plant <coughs> um, and if you look I, I flew from I, I normally fly around and I was flying from Moree, uh, Sydney to Moree and I looked out over the landscape and all I could see in the distance was flickers of little dams mm, yeah. in the sun in the sun because mm. the sun was going down and you know the amount of water that has been taken out of out of the river systems it's phenomenal. Like Cubby Station holds more water than Sydney Harbour. I think they need to get away. I, I, I wouldn't have a, a, an issue with, with irrigation for food. But the majority of the irrigation is for cotton and food fibre, uh, and, and for fibre. Mm -hmm. And it's these big companies that are making money out of these huge investments, you know. And... Um, um, my, my friend and uh, one of our board members, I don't know if you know him, Michael Anderson, he always says that we've never ceded. We still own the water. We still own the land. So we should be the ones that are controlling it. But in a system where we're, we're a capitalist society, it's the people with the most money that, that makes the most benefits out of it. But I think, you know, we have to reduce the reliance on water and the best way to reduce the reliance of war on water is to look at a sustainable um, natural food source and natural food sources that are there. You know, we went out... When I, I put a couple of slides up yesterday when we were... or the other day when we were talking, and we had the, the government people in the room. And when they came in, we all came in, I, I had some little cups, and there's a, there's a young guy down at Bogabilla. Um, he's... Um, making tea out of the yara bush, so, he, you know, and, the, and they're using the honey. So I filled it up with a tea bag and some honey, and I actually gave him a cup, and I said, he's a cup of, em he's an empty cup, can you go and fill it up with water? Then I asked him to sip it through the day. So 
um, here's a young gentleman that, that's wanting to, 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 to grow the, the Ura tree and, produ and, and, and produce um, teas out of it as well. But it's also a medicine plant and all of that. So I think for us in Australia, we, we need to look at sustainable development. Um, we can't look at huge scale development and expect that Mother Earth is going to just, um, you know, put up with it. And like that old fella said in that video, he said, the Mundagata is not happy at the moment because they are raping the system. So what he's doing, he's, he's taking all that water away. And once we start looking after the system, then he'll bring that water back. Yeah. So, yeah, I think just sustainable, sustainable um, agriculture, you know, um, and we've seen the statistics with, um, with the kangaroo presentation, and I think that, you know, the amount of water that, that's needed for cotton, it's just unviable. Yeah. And I know Mary has a quick question, but um, I remember when your, um, I don't know if it's with the nation or the, the complete connection of them, um, put their constitution together and had rights of nature in there. Can you very, very quickly tell people about that? I think a lot of folks okay. might not know. Um, we declared our independence in 2012. Mm. Um, and as a part of that, we've done two things. We looked around the world for, for de independence decorations and we use the Israeli declaration as a guide mm. when, we, when, we, when we declared our independence. And then we looked around the world for constitutions. <laughs> so there was a little island in the Pacific and it's the island where Australia sends all their boat people now, Nauru. Mm. And we, we, we modelled our constitution on that. But we, when we're sitting down and we're, we're, we're discussing it and all that, that type of stuff, we said, who is the most important person on this planet? And we thought it was Mother Earth. And the rivers within the system, they're the veins of Mother Earth. And, you know, I know that um, New Zealand now is protecting their rivers and there's another, uh, another country that's pr protecting um, in their constitution as well. So we also decided to protect Mother Earth in our constitution. Look, I don't know whether we'll ever get independence or not, but if we ever get independence, Mother Earth is looked after in our constitution. And, um, you know, when people come onto our country, under our constitution, they are also responsible for Mother Earth, mm. not only the, the, the government. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Ah, oh, I love that. <laughs> um, uh, I just uh, didn't want to ask a question, just to say from our point of view, from down the Gold Coast, um, the Yugen Bear mob, we, and I know other people too, uh, other groups are looking at your... Um, the system that you've just been describing, um, we're very uh, influenced and uh, encouraged by it because our lot and others are trying to do the, exactly the same thing, to renew and reinvigorate um, our own governance systems, um, working out our own um, ways of dealing within, with, with different um, groups within our mob, but also with our neighbours and, and so on and so on. So really bringing back... Um, but really strengthened, though, too. But, and looking at these other things like economy, e economics and things, you know, how do we deal with that in our areas, respective areas, um, to the role of uh, older people in it, you know, um, our own uh, systems of power and authority, how does that work out, you know? We had a bit of an experiment when the Commonwealth Games was on, which were kind of quite successful, really, <laughs> we thought, um, at the time. And um, I just wanted to say, I just regard what you've been saying, and I know I've heard you talk before at different forums, you know, I totally agree, totally agree with it, you know. I think it's, I think it's great. It's the only way we have to go because, um, yes, where I, I, you know, I've kind of stopped for my own personal political reasons, stopped using terms to do with sovereignty and um, self-determination and even sometimes even culture I get tired of because it means everything and nothing after a while, you know. But I, I have tended to use the term being owners and runners of country. That's what we are. We have never, we've always been that and we've never stopped being that. So we've got to do that more, we believe, in more concrete ways, absolute concrete ways. 
and to, to let mainstream know that we are the authority in this country. All 3% of us, as against 97%, you know. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just talking to the young lady up the back there, Auntie Mary, out, out, out the front, and um, one of the things that we looked at when we, we were looking at all of this stuff, we believe we have a legal right in this country under common law. And I was just telling her, and I, I implore all of you, so if you go to the High Court in Canberra, just have a look at the way the flags are flying at the High Court and the way that they're flying everywhere else around. And if you go to the High Court also and you, look, you walk into the High Court and you look up and you walk up, there's a ramp that walks up. And when we, we went to the, and visited the High Court um, last year and, and the guide that was taking us around, he said, and there's five paintings that are in the High Court on that wall. And he said, you know, after Mabo, they replaced the photo of the Queen. There was a big photo of the Queen in the High Court. They replaced that and they put our Jukapar up there. Ah, because Mabo said, our Jukapa and our law is not a construct of common law. It sits outside common law. And Mabo also said that the Crown did not gain absolute beneficial ownership to this land. And in brackets, an allodial title. That, sticks with, that stays with us. We've never given that away. And, and we still own the land, Auntie Mary, you know, and, and I, I, um, you know, I think that um, there are a lot more people out there now that are understanding that as well. Mm. We have a lot more support now as well. But I need to say this to you, Auntie, that's an honour, hearing that from yourself, because, you know, um, you're a well-respected person around this country. And for you to say that to me standing here today, I'm honoured. Thank Aww. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you.